as as you've heard and as I'm sure you understand, there are a whole bunch of different players in, in the mobile commerce space. There's the networks, Visa and MasterCard. There's the merchants. There's the card issuers, which is the credit card companies. There are the debit card issuers, which are on the debit side. There are the mobile payment enablers. There are the operators. There are the chip manufacturers. There are just lots and lots of people. So the question, one of the questions I have is who's going to win in mobile payments? Who are going to be the winners in 2014? Not the consumer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, when the consumer wins, um, that's when the merchants will start, you know, improving their acceptance methods and broadening them. You know? mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I don't know who the winners are going to be this year. I think you're going to see a lot of retail retailers and merchants find a value proposition, a return on investment, uh, to promote some type of a, uh, a mobile engagement with their consumers that will probably involve more value-add services, like um, loyalty and, and offers, um, and payments are just going to kind of drag along with it. So, um, you know, I think the winners this year, um, not the consumers. <laughs> I don't think it has to be a zero-sum game, right? I think the, the goal for the entire ecosystem should be to increase the size of the pie. And I think there is definitely uh, an opportunity for that. Um, merchants are probably the most frustrated, and you've seen that by way of, uh, and I think we will cover the target story at the end, but that's a perfect example of merchants being forced to um, own liability on a system that they didn't build but that they are forced to secure. It's not my, um, by the way, this quote is not mine. But essentially, that's what a merchant feels that he is doing. So going forward, you'll see, and that's why merchants are trying to own their own payment framework going forward. And you'll start seeing you know, other players get into, um, you know, a, a, a anybody who has scale today, Twitter, Facebook, and whoever who has scale is going to try and look at payments as a utility, as an additional enabler of what the ecosystem currently provides from a customer standpoint. So you'll start seeing more parties come into this. Ultimately, the consumer, I think consumer will benefit because this will lead to newer ways to engage with the brand, newer ways to engage with your phone. I think everybody wins if you can set aside the fact that you know some only one person has to win. I think there's uh, a number of winners who provide, so consultants, vendors like ourselves, the systems integrator. I tend to agree that the consumer is probably going, going to have a hard time winning this year, and possibly the merchant, but I think he's going to end up paying. Okay. Uh, Tyrion brought up something that I'm, this is a question that these guys haven't been asked, so it would be fun to see what they say, but uh, there is this organization that has been created by merchants called MCX, Merchant Cup Customer Exchange, started by Walmart and Target, and they have any number, they have a bunch of major retailers involved, and they're basically creating their own mobile payment system, independent of the networks, um, and basically trying to build their own payment structure so they don't have to deal with the networks and they can lower their costs. So I'd like to get my panel's perspective on, on what they think about MCX and where they think uh, it might end up. Can we mix it up a bit? Maybe start that angle. Yeah, start with Phil. Uh, a couple of years ago I asked the question of somebody, what is this thing MCX? And he said, think about Walmart. They sell a half a trillion dollars a year. And think about cards. 50% of the transactions are in cards and I'll let you guys do the math. And that's going to cost them typically about one and a half, two percent. And if they can save one percent, they can pay for the investment in MCX. But then Durbin came along and he cut the cost of, inter of interchange, the monies the merchant pays to the issuing bank by half. And then Judge Leon came on, along and he's talking about cutting it again in half. So the MCX value proposition begins to get a little bit murky. And then you think about what they're trying to do inside the cloud. And inside the cloud, what they want to do is link their payment mechanism to a funding account. Call it a credit card, call it a, check, a checking account. If it's credit card, they still have to pay interchange. So they're not going to win on that one. If it's a checking account, because of the way our 
automated clearing house is set up, they don't have a guarantee of funds until the following day so that there will be a risk exposure that they have to deal with. So I think MCX has got an uphill battle right now. So yeah, I'll go next. Um, you know, it's a real challenge when you, if you don't start with a consumer value proposition and your motivation for trying to create something is to just benefit your organization, your sponsors, it, it, generally they don't succeed. Um, so, you know, I think MCX might succeed, but most of their motivation is around lowering interchange for the retailers and the merchants as opposed to what am I doing to add value for consumers. So I think you've heard a bunch of us say on the panel that really consumers, I mean, Raphael and I said they won't be the winners in 2014, but ultimately I think they will be the winners because I think all this competition, all this desire to try and create engagement to own the relationship with the consumer, um, it, it, the way to do that is to make it more convenient and to give them some value for switching payment types. And when you do that, they'll start adopting. So I guess to bring that back to MCX, um, you know, they may succeed. Uh, but I think the genesis of the idea behind them, which isn't creating value for consumers, probably leads to less success. So I have to be the contrarian, right? Um, so how many people here has a cap Capital One card and decides one point morning that I will only go to a retailer who accepts Capital One? Anybody ever made a decision such as that? Because your loyalty, ultimately, at the end of the day, is to a retail brand, not to uh, an issuer, not to a bank. Sure, it is. I mean, to a certain extent, you, you want the points that you get. It's a very flimsy thread, if you look at it, between you and your card. It's a much more stronger bond that you have with your merchant. Because I go to Costco, I go to Walmart, and that's where I shop. And it's really hard, and, and Tad, Tad actually picked up on it in the beginning when he said that payment, you know, changes around payments has to be driven by you know, additional value add, additional incentives. Otherwise, it's really hard to break that behavior. So here's what I'm, uh, you know, and I, this is no way, um, and I'm no way saying that this is what MCX is going to do. But let's assume your household, you spend $400 every month towards five of the con you know, retailers in that consortium, Walmart, Costco, Target, and Kohl's, for example. If the consortium were to come back to you and say, listen, you spend $400 with us every month, we are going to give you, so if, let's say you increase your spend starting next month to 450, we will give you $50 additional purchasing power. It's, and we will give that to you by way of free products, coupons, whatever it may be. But you essentially, what you're going to get is you're going to get $500 of purchasing power with $400, I mean $450 of investment. And that's going to make a lot of sense to a single mom or, or, or probably all mothers, including mom. And they will think as to these are the places that I shop today and if they're going to give me additional $50 purchasing power just so that I shift my spend from my Capital One credit card to this new thing, I might do it. And I can't seem to think anybody who would say that they wouldn't. Now fraud, obviously, you know, you have scenarios such as Target which brings that question uh, you know, back into focus which says, you know, who makes the customer whole when there is fraud. And I think that has to be addressed. But from a value proposition perspective, I mean, they've got a pretty solid one because that's where you shop today. They drive more than $1 trillion in, in, rev, in, 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 in transactions every year, these 60 uh, retailers combined. That's not something that you can ignore. Yeah, so I'm just going to take a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B. So I think, you know, definitely like the loyalty aspect, um, you know, I suggest everyone look up MCX and the sort of players that are in there, but, you know, these are some of the biggest retailers um, in the world and they've banded together to develop a common, well, hopefully develop a common platform. Um, that loyalty proposition um, is going to be immense, but again, loyalty isn't something new. The consumer has had loyalty for a long time. 
I think if they have a new payment mechanism for them to utilise, that can be more rewarding to the consumer. Absolutely, um, they're going. To, the consumer is going to be driven to that. Um, but then again, it comes to us. Uh, there needs to be a balancing act between security and convenience, or security and reward. Um, you know, I think everyone's read about Target. Um, if there's a payment mechanism that's um, implemented there that isn't as secure or has the responsibility as the likes that we have with payment schemes, if I have fraud on my American Express, I get it taken off immediately. Um, if that isn't inherent in that system, um, you know, obviously uh, c consumers, customers are going to be wary of it. But at the end of the day, like I'm, you know, I'm not going to hypothesise, you know, what is MCX's ambition, intention. Um, we don't know it. They're being quite um, coy about it, but. Um, you know, it can potentially be to drive consumers towards them. It can also be potentially a leverage game against the payment schemes to, uh, you know, try and uh, reduce that interchange fee. We don't know what it is. Um, we hope as a consumer at heart, but it, it could be a, a, a factor of things. And one thing I'll remind you of is that even if it's massively successful, they still have to accept my Visa card. Right. So it's an additive cost no matter what. Um, I'm going to ask one more question of the panel, and, and I know this is something that everybody's kind of interested in. The, the target security breach obviously is a huge deal. It's a very big deal in payments. It's, it's kind of a, an earth-shaking kind of event. I'd like to ask you guys what you think about it overall and what its impact might be on mobile payments going forward. Any volunteers? I'll, I'll pick it up. How many people here actually check their statements every day morning since the target uh, fiasco happened? Just barely a, a few. Most of us don't care. We know that we, at the end of the day, we will be made whole by uh, our banks because Reg E and Regulation Z make sure that the consumer has to be made whole for fraud that you know that that we didn't have control over. And that's where you know. So you know, to back to my point about MCX, that's where the retailers who are pushing for cheaper costs of payment acceptance are going to come up against is that they don't have the same kind of protections that we get on debit and credit today because that's mandated and when you know and so th that's obviously one thing 24 for 2014 is going to play out is this whole issue of the aftermath of the breach and what that means to payments in general is something that would be very interesting to watch let me ask the audience a quick question how many of you want a more secure card or a more secure payment system because of the target breach <laughs> That's a reasonable number. We obviously, as a provider of secure payment cards, we're asking this question. What we think hopefully is going to happen is that this will stimulate the migration to EMV that is already in train. EMV and NFC happen to be synonymous. NFC payments are based around EMV, and that secure element provides the same level of security. The question about NFC as a result of Target is a question again of the ROI. Is the merchant willing to invest in the proximity NFC antenna? And if he is, then great, we'll see mobile payments take off a la proximity. I don't think it's going to drive it. I think it's going to be one of those, it gets carried along as Visa MasterCard are proposing with the migration to a more secure payment network. Okay, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I think, agree with Cherian on, on this one. Um, until the consumer feels the pain, um, so there's a target breach, it's going to cost somebody money, um, but is it going to cost the consumer money? So I don't wake up worried about it because I feel like I'm protected. Um, ultimately, that cost gets passed back down to the consumers, but I don't know that they see it. So um, I think it's a big deal to breach. I think it's a big deal to the people in this room. I think it's a big deal to everybody in the industry. And I think it's important to consumers. They notice it, they think about it, and it might give them some pause when they're thinking about a new payment type. But I, but I don't think most consumers are really losing sleep over whether or not I'm going to get really hurt because there was a breach of target. And I want to add one more thing to that, Pat, if I could. Imagine why those protections exist today, the, the Reg E and the Reg Z. 
They exist because the payment system is weak, and it's you know you could say it's weak by design, but it's weak. When we move to more secure products such as EMV, and you have a chip and a pin that you have to authorize each transaction with, fraud's gonna when fraud happens, it's gonna come on you. It's good. the liability is ultimately gonna shift on the consumer. So today I could necessarily just leave my card so that my wife goes shopping and I can claim that it's fraud, and I will be made whole. But when I give my chip and I, I pin card, yeah, <laughs> this is what I do. Thank you for the idea. <laughs> when I give my chip and pin card, I add the pin to my wife and she uses it. Well, if I claim that's fraud, that's not going to fly because the pin is supposed to be kept secret. And a liability will ultimately fall upon me. So there is always uh, you know, a yin and yang. It it's ultimately has two sides. I'm going to jump in here. Credit versus debit. I think Reg E, Reg Z, and this concern, lack of concern when it's a credit card transaction is absolutely correct. But if I lose money from my debit account, my checking account, then I as a consumer have to make myself whole by complaining. And I think that's something that the consumer is very aware of. Credit card, I totally agree with my colleagues here. Debit, I'm a little bit more leery because the money comes out of my account and I got to fight to get it back.